morning and happy Easter. Welcome to Harvest Ministries. I want to welcome our online uh, partners who are watching us this morning as well. We hope you've had a blessed day so far, and I'm sure most of you have a lot of activities planned for this uh, afternoon and maybe into the evening, but thank you for taking some time to be with us uh, this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what this day is all about. Uh, we were here Friday night for a good Friday service, and the stone was over the tomb, and today the stone has been rolled away from the tomb. He is alive, he is risen, he is well, and uh, we believe he is still changing lives and, and transforming lives today as well. If you are here for the very first time, thank you for being our guest today, and hopefully if you're here for the first time, you got a little card that looks like this, and if you take some time to fill that card out, even now while I'm talking, it's fine. And on the back wall as you exit today, there's a drop box. You can drop it in that box, and we would appreciate you doing that for us. Just let us know who is here, and I promise you I won't call you tomorrow. I won't come visit you tomorrow, uh, but this lets us know who is here. So thank you for taking time to fill that out for us. did want to mention some things that we have going on around our church in case you're looking for some place to be involved or maybe looking for a new church home. Uh, on most Sunday mornings, not this morning, but every other Sunday morning, we have an adult Bible study in our lower level community room that is led by Ken Divers, does an excellent job teaching the scripture. And so if you'd like to be involved in an adult Bible study, we invite you to come on Sunday mornings at nine o'clock to be a part of that. Also, we have our Harvest Youth and they've just all come in and sit on the front row here. And uh, they have a great day plan. Once the worship time is over here, they'll be exiting the building. Uh, if you're not on the front row with them, and you're a middle school, the high schooler, they'd love to have you exit with them. And our youth pastor, Robin, will be taking them out. Uh, and they have uh, something really interesting. It's called Resurrection Egg Scavenger Hunt. And uh, what we did yesterday is all out in this field over here are life-size examples of the resurrection. And so there's a huge jar of vinegar out there. Uh, there are huge dice out there. There are big spikes out there. Uh, so all kinds of things they'll be looking for, and they're going to be learning about the resurrection uh, today. But if you'd like to go with them when they exit middle or high schoolers, please follow them out. Also, we have our nursery available out these doors to my left and to your right if you have uh, zero to two-year-olds, and they will love on your babies, pray for them, take care of them while you have uh, some time in here today uh, to focus on the Word. And we always ask you to pray for our kids' ministries. They're meeting the lower level today. Uh, please pray for our kids' pastor and her workers who are helping her. If you're looking for a Bible study, ladies, we have a great study going on on Tuesdays, uh, April the 19th. Uh, there's two options, 10 a.m. or 6.30 p.m. Linda Oz leads this for us. So even if you haven't been here for the study, just come out anyway, and they'll get you caught up. But that'll be up here in the upper level in our meeting room, but they'd love to have you join them on Tuesday night uh, or Tuesday morning, whichever works best for you. On Wednesday night, we have our online Bible study. Our associate pastor, Pastor Robbie Boyd, is leading this series for us. And his special guest will be Rebecca Covert. And uh, she's been with him before on these studies. They have a great uh, time together and uh, sharing the scripture together and breaking it down so we can all understand it better. So if you'd like to tune into our Harvest Ministries Facebook page, we would love to have you do that. Well, we're not going to take a lot of time today. We have several things going on. But uh, we do want to take time to have prayer today and invite the presence of the Lord to be in our service. Uh, whatever needs you may have today, perhaps you need a physical healing. Uh, maybe there's something going on emotionally or spiritually, something going on with anxiety, depression, fear, doesn't matter. We believe when Jesus rose from the grave, he took care of all of that for us. And he is still taking care of those things for us. So where you're at, would you just bow your heads with me this morning? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is a resurrected Lord. That's why we came here today, Lord, to worship and to praise him. And Father, I pray for everyone that's here with us in person, those joining us online this morning, that you would just speak to us in a special way. May your presence be real in this house today. Lord, may people be healed. May they be saved. May they be delivered. May they be set free from whatever is going on in their lives. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And the church says amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for your time this morning. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. 
I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. Long before the beginning of all other beginnings, God is. In a burst of creative activity, God creates the world and everything in it. Humans are designed to live inside of this unique relationship, but they choose otherwise. The law of God is broken, and the heart of God is pierced. But the story isn't over. In the fullness of time, God gives his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus comes to seek and save those who are lost, wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. On the cross, God is in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathes his last. But the story isn't over. On the morning of the third day, the power of the living God erupts, breaking through death with the moment that will define all other moments. Perched at the edge of heaven, the angels stand in awe as one of their own rolls away the stone that's guarding the body of Jesus. As if anything can guard Jesus. He walks out of the tomb alive. He is victorious. He is conquering death and rendering the grave unnecessary. He is living and moving and breathing 
as only the risen Son of God can. But the story isn't over. We are, every one of us, searching and hoping and longing for life. It's a desire that's been deposited into our souls by the very same God who spoke it all into existence. And it's this exact life that the resurrection of Jesus invites us into. So bring your hopes, your regrets, your successes, and your failures. Bring your doubts, your joys, your fears, and your dreams. Be resolute and unwilling to settle for anything less than the abundant life of the risen King. Because truly, if the story isn't over, then what happens next might just change everything. with us this morning our risen savior he is not dead but he is alive if you feel comfortable put your hands together with us we're gonna sing risen and risen he's risen forever glorified risen he's risen king jesus Same power. 
Savior. Amen. Amen and amen. sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Money was a ransom faithfully born. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over Laid on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began is over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins Come join the song on the 
of all the redeemed Yes, we're free, free forever, amen When death was arrested and my life began When death was arrested and my life began When death was arrested and my life began Jesus, 
everything else, no matter what we do, you died for us, God. There's nothing too big, too great that we can do to get rid of your love, God. We worship you, God. There's a place where mercy reigns and never streams of grace flow deep and wide where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down and at the I surrender my life, I'm in. 
sins washed white, I owe to you. Thank you for coming to save us, God. Thank you for giving your ultimate gift, God, just for us. Lowly sinners, Father, we owe our lives to you, God. May we never forget that, Father. We worship you, Father. Your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen, amen. At the cross, at the cross. Our youth are being uh, let out. If you're a middle school, high school, like to go with them, uh, please feel free to just follow them out. They're going to have a great time learning on their level. And uh, as I thought about the song we just sang, At the Cross, I was looking around at the Easter decorations, and I'd like to thank Christina Hall for doing that for us this year, taking care of that. But uh, what a powerful visual of the cross of Christ and what he did for us. Well, today we're going to be talking about Jesus and specifically, no other name. That's what Easter is all about. It is about the name of Jesus and the person of Jesus. And our key passage today says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there was no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So Easter has come, and in a few hours it will be gone. But not everyone is smiling about Easter this year. And that is part of the paradox of Easter every year when it comes around. Today is considered the holiest day on the Christian calendar. But not everyone shares our joy this morning that we're celebrating here in this service. Some people don't care that it is Easter. Some don't believe in anything related to Easter and Jesus. And many don't know what to believe any longer. In fact, there are some that are very angry that the thought of a man rising from the dead because it challenges everything they think they know about this world. It is Easter that reminds us in the biggest possible way that God plays by his own rules. Once we realize this, that God doesn't always have to do what we expect, we will be much better off in our lives. In fact, sometimes God does what we least expect that he is going to do. And often he does things that defy human understanding. Today we celebrate the event of a person, Jesus, rising from the dead. I think that falls into the category of defying what we think and what we believe. In fact, you can live for a long time and never see anyone raised from the dead. I don't know this for certain, but I'm going to make an assumption today uh, a gentleman in our congregation, Roy Dent, is probably the oldest person here. He's 93. If you're older than that, I apologize. But he's 93, and I don't think he's ever seen a person raised from the dead in his 93 years of living. It defies human logic. It defies human thinking. It defies everything that we think and know about the universe around us. And so you can live for a very long time and never see anyone raised back to life that was dead. I know I've never seen that before, even in my own life. So try to imagine on that first Easter how the disciples must have felt when they discovered that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb and the tomb was empty. Their first thought was not, Jesus is risen from the dead. That was not the first thought they had, that Jesus is risen from the dead. In fact, they thought the exact opposite that someone had entered the tomb at night and stolen the body of Jesus out of the tomb. When Mary, the women, first got to the tomb on that first Easter morning, they saw that the tomb was empty and they wept and the angel told them, or she told the angel, they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. Resurrection was the last thing on Mary's mind on that first Easter morning. But eventually, as we read the scripture, all of the believers of Jesus began to believe in the resurrection. It didn't happen suddenly. For some, it took days. Maybe some, it took weeks. Maybe even some took months to fully believe in the resurrection of Jesus. But soon, the truth would hit home with them. Jesus is alive. 
And then they began to whisper that behind closed doors. Jesus is alive. And then with the holy boldness after the Acts 2 Pentecost experience, they began to preach it in the streets with boldness. Jesus is alive. He is alive. Finally, they took that message to the entire Roman Empire of their day, and they told the entire world that Jesus is alive. And so a few weeks after Easter, Peter and John, who were two followers of Jesus, were on their way to the temple. And on the way to the temple, they met a disabled man who asked them for money. This was not uncommon in their culture, where people with disabilities would beg for alms or beg for money to help them survive. This was not an uncommon occurrence. But as this man asked Peter and John for some money to help him, freshly empowered by the Spirit of God, a new boldness upon them, Peter looks at the man and says, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Don't you wish you had that kind of power today? You can have that kind of power if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You can be empowered to command people who are sick to be well. You can pray for the sick and they can be healed. You can pray for those in bondage and they can be set free. Silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have I'm going to give to you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. The man stood up, the Bible says, completely healed. Not only was he walking, but he began jumping and praising God. All of this ruckus created a crowd who wanted to see what was going on that day. And it began to gather around Peter, who had made this great proclamation. And as the crowd gathered around Peter, he began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them, challenging them to repent of their sins and turn to Christ for salvation. But just like our day, how many know that everybody doesn't like to hear the message of Jesus Christ? They don't want to always hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They think Jesus should be shut down and shoved aside and not mentioned in society and in public places. The same was true then as it is now. So the Jewish rulers of that day heard about this event that had taken place, a man who could not walk but who was now walking and jumping and leaping and praising God. And they had Peter and John arrested and held overnight. Acts 4, 2 tells us that the rulers were disturbed because the apostles were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. That disturbed them. This was most, like, most likely a group called the Sadducees. Now in this day, the Sadducees were a group and the Pharisees were a group. Pharisees gave Jesus all kind of trouble when he was preaching and sharing and doing what he was doing. But the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead in any sense. So the preaching that Jesus himself had risen from the dead had to be stopped as quickly as possible. We don't believe in this. We don't accept this. We've got to stop it as soon as we can. This illustrates the point that I made earlier, that some people have always hated Easter because it challenges their belief system. The very idea that someone could come back from the dead, flies in the face of their self-professed knowledge of science and the universe. So they were arrested and they were held overnight. The next day, the scripture tells us that Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin. This would be the, the Supreme Court of ancient Israel. It consisted of 70 men who were authorized to enforce the Jewish law and to try cases and to settle disputes. In Acts 4 and 7, we are told that the Sanhedrin asked these two followers of Jesus, these two apostles, a very leading question. By what power or in whose name have you done this? Have you done what? Have you healed this disabled man? In whose power and in whose name have you done this? What a question to ask Peter and John. And if you can really put yourself in their mindset, you begin to think about the implications of the response that they will give. In fact, this is the first recorded persecution in the Christian era, Acts 4-7. The first time we read about and see Christian persecution. 
We know that since that time, millions of Christians have suffered and died for their faith. We know that on this very day around this world, there are people in other countries who are Christians who do not have the freedom and the liberty to serve God and to worship God like you and I are doing here this morning. We know that in many nations around this world or countries around this world, that Christians are martyred in prison for their belief system. In fact, we have brothers and sisters in our own faith family around the world who struggle with this on a daily basis. They have to hide to worship. They have to be secretive about what they're doing. They can't be in the open and, and talk about Jesus like we're talking about him today. Many have spent years in prison for nothing more than preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as Peter and John stand before these 70 Jewish leaders, this Supreme Court of Israel, they have a decision to make. What are we going to say? What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, let me just tell you this morning that every day you face a decision about how you're going to respond to those around you when it comes to issues of faith. Will you be silent? Will you speak up? Will you try to hide your faith? Will you try to talk about it in the house or just around your friends who are believers? Or will you boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ is still alive and is transforming lives today? We all have a choice to make. So what will Peter do? He appears to be the mouthpiece of this duo. How will he respond to their questions? As I read the story, I see that Peter has three options. First, he can apologize for making trouble. Basically, apologize for healing this disabled man. But there's no way that Apostle Peter is going to apologize for commanding this man to be healed and him walking and jumping and praising God. That's not going to happen. Secondly, he can do what many believers do in our culture today, is just say nothing and hope for the best. But as you read the scripture, and if you know anything about the life of the Apostle Peter, he never said nothing at any point in his lifetime. So we know he can't be silent and just hope for the best. Or thirdly, Peter can seize the moment and he can preach the gospel and tell these 70 leaders about Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what he does. Money cannot buy this kind of audience. He couldn't have had the biggest crusade in Israel and this crowd be sitting in front of him. He couldn't pay for this kind of audience. If you would think about it, it would be like in our nation, in the United States, having the president, all of his cabinet members, all of Congress, and the Supreme Court all together at one time sitting at your feet listening to you speak. That's how big this moment was in Peter's life. This was a, a, an event that would never be matched again in his ministry. In front of these men who look at Peter and, and look at John as dangerous troublemakers, Peter stands up and preaches Jesus. He doesn't compromise. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't make any apologies. And what he says doesn't last very long. Only five verses in Acts chapter 4. But in these five verses, we find some amazing truths about Jesus that we can learn from today as we learn who Jesus is. The first thing Peter talks about is the rejected stone. Peter answers their question that they ask him, by what power or whose name did you preach this or do this or heal this man? And the answer is simply, Jesus. Peter could have stopped there, but he didn't stop there. He continues his answer knowing that he may never have this opportunity again. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected which has become the cornerstone. In these two verses, Peter says something to these Jewish leaders. First, you crucified Jesus. That's true. They crucified Jesus. They had him put to death on the cross. 
Secondly, Peter says, God raised him from the dead. That's also true. Thirdly, Peter says, his power healed this disabled man. That's true. And fourthly, he tells them that you rejected God's stone of salvation. It's interesting in this passage that Peter quotes from Psalm 118, verse 11. Days earlier, Jesus quoted from the same passage when he talked about the parable of the landowner in Matthew chapter 21. The imagery here is of an ancient rock quarry. And in these ancient rock quarries, highly trained stonemasons carefully chose the stones that would be used in construction. If you've ever been in Lowe's or Home Depot or some lumber yard, I don't know if you've ever been in these places or not, but if you go over to the lumber section, you'll see guys pulling off two by fours and four by eights, and they, they drop them down on the ground, and they eyeball them like this. And then they flip them over and do like that. Well, I know a cricket board when I see a cricket board, but I feel compelled every time I go into one of these places to do the same thing these guys are doing. And so I yank a two by four down and eye it up and flip it over and look at it, look where the knots are at, and put it back on the shelf. I might even buy the two by four. I just walk in there and do that sometimes. Because <laughs> all these guys are doing it. There are some builders in our church, and they're highly trained at what they do. They can look at a board or look at a, a piece of wood or whatever it might be, and they can say, that's good, that's bad, that's good, that's bad. And that's what it was in these stone quarries. Highly trained specialists would go in and look at the stones that were going to be used in the construction of whatever they were building. And there was no stone more important than the cornerstone in that building and in that construction project. Because the integrity of that stone allowed everything else to be built upon it. And the cornerstone had to contain the exact right lines. If it wasn't exactly right, the entire building would be out of line. And so the builders would inspect many stones and they would reject each one until they found the perfect stone. Rejected stones might be used in other parts of the building, but they would never become the cornerstone. And they would never become the capstone, which was the last stone that's put in place. And as Peter stands before this crowd of men, he is saying that Jesus is the rejected stone. God made him to be the cornerstone. But because he didn't measure up to you and your standards, because he didn't look like what you thought he should look like, because he didn't speak the way you thought he should speak, and because he didn't hate people that you hate, and because he wasn't biased like you are, you rejected him. And yet God made him to be the cornerstone to build our salvation on. These Jewish leaders had rejected him, but God not only accepted him, Peter says, he says he put him in the position of highest honor possible. And the shocking part of this is that these religious leaders should have known better. But they didn't recognize Jesus for who he was. Sadly, today, many people have rejected Jesus. They're rejecting God's hope and plan of salvation. And they're trying to build their lives on everything else but him. We try to build our lives on our careers, and we try to build it on our education. We try to build it on our finances and our hobbies and, and the possessions that we have in this life. And we try to build life on everything else but Jesus. And we reject him because he doesn't look like what we think it should look like. And it doesn't measure up to our standards. But let me be clear this morning. It's not enough to say that Jesus was a, a good man or that Jesus was a good teacher or, or even an excellent religious leader but not the Son of God. If he is not who he said he was, then Jesus cannot be trusted in anything that he said. He said, I am the Son of God. I am the cornerstone of your salvation, and you must build your life upon me. So let me ask you this morning, have you rejected Jesus in your life? Have you rejected him as a stone in your life? 
And if so, what are you building your life on today? Second thing Peter talks about is the living stone. In verse 10, Peter said very clearly, you crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. This raises us the question, how could the name of Jesus heal the disabled man? Peter says it happened because Jesus rose from the dead. In other words, Jesus is the living stone. Now, I don't know, some of you are our guests here today, and we welcome you into our service, but we still pray for people who are sick in our church. We, we still do what the Bible tells us, and we anoint with oil. We lay hands on them, and we pray for them. And we pray a prayer of faith over them, believing that because Jesus rose from the dead, and he is the living stone, that just like this man who was disabled, that Jesus still heals people today. And we believe that in this church, and we, and we practice that. And you say, well, pastor, I don't you know, believe you all that stuff about healing. I don't know about that. Well, there's a lady in our congregation. Her name is Juanita Dooley. She's not in here right now. A couple weeks ago, Tony, am I right? She had a mini stroke, some type of stroke in her body. Affected her speech, threw her face over. All kind of side effects she was having. That was on a Saturday, I think. Came to church that morning. And we prayed for her that morning. Came back again that night, I believe, on a Sunday night. And we anointed with oil, prayed for her. She goes home, has the tests and everything. But guess what happens in between all that? God healed her body. Healed her body. <laughs> Paralysis gone, speech normal, everything is fine. And she told me this morning, Pastor, God healed my body. I went for the MRI and all the scans anyway. And she said, I told the doctor when they put me in that machine, I don't need to be here because Jesus has healed me. We believe that. He heals people of sickness and disease. Why? Because he is the living stone and because he rose from the dead. And Peter says, because he is alive, that is why this disabled man is healed. And so he joins two images of Jesus together, the stone and Jesus as the source of life. And when we merge them, we have the living stone. The late Reverend Dr. Billy Graham said it this way, a dead Jesus can't save anyone, but a living Christ can change your life. Some of you are living proof of that today. Christ has changed your life. You were going down one pathway, but Christ turns you around and puts you on another pathway. He changed your life. Dead Christ can't do that. Positive thinking can't do that. Just feeling good about yourself can't do that. It takes a living Christ to change your life. On that Friday, we call it Good Friday, that Jesus died. It looked like Satan had won. But on Sunday, Jesus won the only battle that really mattered. It's like the words of the old song that say, I've read the back of the book and we win. We win in the end, and it is true. We win the ultimate battle in the end. And knowing that we win in the end helps us deal with what comes in between. There's some stuff that'll come in between. Your life as it is right now, and even how it might be in the future may not be pleasant. But you can overcome it if your faith is in the one who rose from the dead. You may be having difficulty. Maybe you're, you're divorced, or maybe you're separated. Maybe your children are just doing crazy things. Maybe your career has fallen apart. Maybe you don't even have a career now, and you're not sure what to do. But if you will put your faith in the living Savior, he will help you in the in-between. That's what it means to call Jesus a living stone. We now have hope to face whatever life throws at us. The late Bishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa said it this way, nothing could have been deader than Jesus on the cross on that first Good Friday. And the hopes of his disciples appeared to die with his crucifixion. And then Easter happened. Jesus rose from the dead. The incredible, the unexpected happened. Life triumphant over death. Light over darkness. Love over hatred. Good over evil. This is what Easter means. Hope prevails over despair. So Jesus, the rejected stone, became Jesus, the living stone, 
who is now Jesus, the cornerstone. Just as the cornerstone was the first stone laid, and as such determined the placement of every other stone in the building, the capstone came last and was placed on top of the arch in ancient building, thus holding all the other stones in perfect alignment. God has made Jesus the cornerstone and the capstone of salvation. Everything begins with Jesus, the cornerstone, and everything ends with Jesus, the capstone. If you miss Jesus, then you miss everything that God has for us. Finally, we come to the end of Peter's message before the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders. And he says this, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Those words spoken in the first century sound strange to a lot of people in the 21st century. A lot of time has elapsed here. We live in an age of intolerance. We live in an age of diversity, political correctness. And these words can sound harsh when you say that there is no other name under heaven given to humanity whereby they must be saved. We would say where they can be saved. No other name. That there's no one else you can cry out to to find the hope of salvation. We believe that you can't find it in Buddha, you can't find it in Confucius, you can't find it in Christian, you can't find it in Muhammad. No one else except Jesus Christ can save you and forgive you of your sins. Jesus is the only Savior God has, and only through faith in him can we escape a place that we call hell. You cannot reject Christ and have any hope of salvation. You cannot look at any other religious leader for salvation. You cannot combine Christ with anyone else or anything else. You're not free to make up your own religion because you can't save yourself. I had a conversation a few months ago with a, an individual who has taken Christianity and is combining it with witchcraft. And we had a conversation about that. And I said, well, you can't mix Christianity and witchcraft together. They don't go together. They don't fit you can choose one, but you can't choose both. You've got to make up your mind what you want to do. And so we had this long conversation about Christianity and witchcraft, trying to merge them together. And yet we see all around us today, in this nation especially, people trying to mix Christianity with whatever they want it to look like and feel like. They say, I'm fine, I'm, I'm good. And yet, Peter was saying here today, would say the same thing to us that he told to the Sanhedrin council. There is no other name under heaven that you can be saved by except the name of Jesus Christ. No other name. We have to come to Christ on his terms. And these words are utterly exclusive. I know that. But I believe they mean exactly what they say. There is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus Christ. Many years ago, Chuck Colson, founder of Prison Ministries, visited India. He preached to huge crowds of mostly Hindus because that's the predominant religion in India is Hinduism. And he said that as I preached to them, the crowds were fascinated by the story of his conversion and they were very responsive when he talked about Jesus so just in, in general terms. He said, but then I began to speak about the resurrection of Jesus and the mood of the crowd began to change you see Hindus believe there are many gods you can serve one or you can serve a dozen you can serve 50 gods or many gods you can serve if you want to and he said they didn't care that Jesus was my guru because they all had their gurus but he said when he spoke of the reason for his faith and his hope, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's almost as though the crowd leaned in to hear what he had to say about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said this, the fact of the resurrection demands a choice, one that reduces all other religions to philosophies. 
The fact of the resurrection demands a choice. It demands that we choose. It demands that we make up our minds and say, I will follow Jesus or I won't follow Jesus. I will reject Jesus or I will accept him as a living stone and as the cornerstone of my life. You see, as long as Jesus is dead, he's just another leader who lived and died and is revered by his followers. But if Jesus really rose from the dead, then he stands alone in the world and no one else can be compared to him. The time will come. The time may be here now for some of you, but you have to decide one way or the other. Who is Jesus to you? Is he the stone that you rejected because he just didn't fit in with your life? Is he a living stone that you accept as a living stone? Or is he the cornerstone of your life? I've asked the worship team to come and lead us in the song this morning. And it talks about the cornerstone. And I promise you, I'm not going to do anything unorthodox this morning right now. I'm not going to do anything strange or out of place, I don't think. I'm just going to ask you to sit while we sing this song and sing with us if you know it. The words will be on the screen, I believe. But I want you to think about your life right now. We may never all be in this room together again like we are right now. We may never all get together. You may never be with your family like you are right now again, ever. This could be it. The last two years, have they taught us anything at all when it comes to COVID? Is that life can change just like that? And people that you knew and people that you loved and people that you cared about can be taken away from you. Some of you are dealing with loss for the very first time. This is the first Easter without mom or dad or a spouse or a child or a parent. Someone you loved and cared about. Why? Because life can change on a dime. It can change instantly for you. How are you living today? Have you rejected Jesus? Or is he the cornerstone of your life? What are you building your life on today? As we sing this, I would just want you to reflect on your life today and then we're going to come back and then we're going to have a time of prayer and then we're going to let you go and do whatever else you have to do for the rest of the day but just for a few moments let's think about life and how we're living it my hope is built on nothing less
continue to play this morning. I'd like for us to sing that third chorus again. But when he comes, how many believe he's coming again? He came once. We celebrate on Christmas. He came as a baby. He came out of the tomb on Easter Sunday. But he's coming back again. And when he comes back the last time, I want to be found in him, serving him, living for him. I want him to be the cornerstone of my life. Could we sing that? Sing it like you mean it this morning, that when he comes again, you want to be found resting in him. keep playing this morning each of you came here for different reasons today some of you came because there was nothing else to do perhaps it's Easter it's tradition you find the church and you go to it some of you came out of habit you come to church every Sunday morning this is just what you do as part of your life as part of who you are some of you are here because a family member invited you or a friend invited you somebody who loves you and cares about you but I don't think you're here by accident today. I think God brought you here just so you could be quiet for a little while so he could communicate with you and talk to you. And one thing I believe God is saying to all of us today in this building and those watching this online is that you matter to me. I care about you. I understand what you're going through. And he's telling you this, I want to have a relationship with you. Your religious background is not important because we're not talking about religion today. We're talking about relationship. That's what Easter is all about. God knows you. He wants you to know him. And how do you do that? You come with an open heart and say, God, here I am. Here I am. Some of you have been close to God in the past, but you've kind of drifted away from that relationship. And God is simply saying to you, come back to me today. Others of you are, are trying to find the right church home and the right fit for you and your family. You haven't settled yet, but the longer you search for the right church home, the further you'll drift away from God in that search. I know it doesn't sound right, but it happens. You'll just drift and drift. And some of you aren't sure that you'd go to heaven if you were to die today. You need to make sure of that. You need to make Jesus the cornerstone of your life. Some of you need to recommit your life to Christ today and get back into that relationship with Him. You see, we're on a spiritual journey. You know, there's a difference on a journey and a destination. Destination is you're trying to get to one place. A journey, there's all kind of things that happen on the journey. That's what makes it interesting. That's what makes life interesting. And there's good things and bad things along the journey of life. But we know and have faith in what our final destination is going to be, and that is heaven. I just want to ask you to bow your heads with me this morning. 
Again, I'm not going to ask you to do anything strange or out of order. But if you say, Pastor Atkins, I'm not sure about my faith life. Or you say, I am sure about my faith life. And I know that I'm not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I would not go to heaven if I were to die today. If that's you, if you have any doubt at all, you just pray a prayer like this. Just pray it silently if you want to. Just say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I ask you to save me today. I put my total trust in you. I want to follow you. And I want to live for you. And then just tell him, thank you for loving me and dying for me. I am saved. And if you prayed that prayer after service, you come and say, Pastor Atkins, I prayed that prayer with you. For those of you who may have drifted away from Christ and you want to get closer to him, just simply say, Jesus, I'm coming home today. I want to make things right. I'm going to stop playing with my faith and I'm going to put my trust and my hope in you. For those looking for that church home, Harvest Ministries would love to be your church family. We welcome you here. This is the place for imperfect people. We'll try to help to teach you how to live and to prepare for when you die. That's two things you need, and we'd love to have you here to try to help you with that. And then there's some of you just barely hanging on this morning. You're discouraged, you're depressed, you're despondent. The pressure and stresses of life have been increasing. You came in here overwhelmed today by life. I think God brought you here to say, give it all to me. Let go and let me work in your life. And so would you just say, Jesus, I'm giving you my problems. I'm giving you my problems. I'm giving you the good and the bad and the ugly of my life. Fill me with your hope and with your presence. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus right now that for those who have prayed these prayers today, you will speak to them, give them hope, give them joy, give them assurance. For that one who accepted you as their Savior for the first time, we praise you for that. For that one who is coming back to faith and renewing and recommitting their faith today, we praise you for that. For that one who was trying to find the church home, we pray for them that they will find the right home for themselves. And for that one who was discouraged and depressed, struggling with the pressures of life and the stresses of life, we pray peace for them now in Jesus' name. And the church says amen. Amen. What a beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning in the Lord's house. But before you go, we'd like to give you a chance to give in our offering and worship that way if you'd like to, if you'd like to give your tithes or offering. Today is for our Mission Possible group. It's a group of individuals in our congregation who have raised tens of thousands of dollars over the years to send mission support around the world to many nations and supporting pastors and indigenous leaders and orphanages and and building churches and, and all those things that they've been involved in. And uh, we thought today we'd like to receive this offering in in honor of one of the the main people that was in this group, Mary Rash. Some of you know Mary Rash. She's been a fixture around this church for almost as long as the church has been around. She's in her later 80s now. Her health has declined tremendously. She's not able to do uh, much of anything at this point in her life. But she has been a woman who has had a heart for missions and uh, our Mission Postal group has been affected tremendously by COVID. Uh, they normally would sell Easter eggs and, and sell products and raise funds and all those things. It's affected everything that they've been able to do in the past years. And so today, we want to honor uh, one of our elders. The Lord has been dealing with me lately uh, in my own life to honor my elders more. I've tried to do a good job of that my entire life, but to go and actually give respect and tell them how special and how important they've been in my life. If there's somebody in your life that you honored that way, let them know before it's too late. Let them know before you can't tell them that face to face. And so this is an offering in honor of her today, and we're going to tell her that we received. She doesn't know this yet. We're going to tell her this offering was received in her honor today, and uh, we'll tell her how much it was as well. But if you'd like to give the support 
uh, nations around the world, every dollar you give, I promise you will go to support the message of Jesus Christ being preached around the world. You can give using our Tidely app if you'd like to do that. You can give online. If you don't have it, download it. Go to our church website. If you're watching, you can mail in a gift, your tithes or offering, 909 Blue Roost Boulevard, Roanoke, Virginia, 24012. If you're here in person, you can use one of the envelopes in the seat back in front of you. Put your name on it, give you credit, make your check out to Harvest Ministries or put cash in it, however you'd like to do it. If you want to swipe a debit or credit card, go to the giving station in the back, swipe a debit or credit card and give it for Mission Possible. God bless you. Would you stand this morning? I did my best to get you out of here by 12 o'clock. I almost made it. Close. Now, a lot of you have kids and teenagers in the lower level and all over the, the campus. Please take your children home with you today. We love them. I've had all the kids I can take this weekend. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Have a great Resurrection Day. We hope to see you next Sunday morning. God bless you. Hi, this is Pastor Milton Atkins. Thank you for joining our service today. It is an honor to have you with us. I just want to mention quickly that we would love to have you partner with us financially. We are trying to pay off the indebtedness on this property. And so I want to ask you to pray about giving $20 a month, $50 a month, or whatever the Lord may lay on your heart. We want to expand our ministry here in the Roanoke Valley and around the world, and you can be a part of making that happen. So God bless you. You'll see at the bottom of the screen several ways you can give and donate. Please prayerfully consider joining us in this mission, and we know God will bless you for that.